I have written a lot, uh, nonfiction books on a wide variety of topics from George Washington to x-rays to Marie Curie to Varian Fry, an American Holocaust rescuer, to tech titans like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and others. So when I begin a project, I really know very little about my topics. And as I begin to do the research, I, I sort of go on a treasure hunt. That's the way I like to look at it. And I use primary sources in order to, to gather the material that I need to write nonfiction books that are not only accurate, but hopefully interesting as well. So when I began to look into this book about George Washington and decided to, to write this book, I really began with George Washington in the very same way. I knew very little about Washington. I'd heard, of course, that he had chopped down the cherry tree, which he didn't. And I had heard that he wore a wig, which he didn't. And I'd heard that he wore wooden teeth, which he didn't. So I found out very quickly the things that I thought I knew about George Washington were absolutely non, not of any of them correct. So as I began this book, uh, which I describe as CSI meets the biography channel, and you'll see why as we go along, it's really been a treat for me to, to replace all of those myths with the facts about George Washington. The premise of the book is really this. Did George Washington really look like his image on the $1 bill? When Mount Vernon did some research, they found that most Americans would describe this image of George Washington taken from the Athenaeum portrait as old, boring, and grumpy. And of course, they realized they were going to have to change that way of looking at the father of our country. They devised a plan in which they would create three life-size figures of George Washington and, and uh, show him at the ages of 19, at 45, and at 57. And to do this, they really compiled a team from, all, from the experts from all over the world. The first one that came to the project was Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz, who is a physical anthropologist, and he began the, the uh, project. From there, it went, uh, he gathered then other experts and they all began with, with these three pieces of art. These were all done by Jean-Antoine Houdon, who was a famous master sculptor of, of the day, of, of Washington's day. And he actually came to Mount Vernon to observe Washington. And while he was there, he created the, the uh, life mask that you see on the right side. And he also created the bust that you see on the left side and gave the bust to Washington as a parting gift when he left. When he went back to his uh, uh, studio in Paris, he created this beautiful marble statue that is still at the Virginia State Capitol in Richmond. So there's no doubt that these three pieces of art show what George Washington looked like at the age of 53. So these were the gold standards for, the pro for this whole project. From there, they uh, got the help of Dr. Anshaman Rosdan, who was with the PRISM laboratory at Arizona State University. And they devised a way to scan all of these priceless artifacts in a way that would not damage them. So as you see, this is actually the, the Washington bust being um, done with a laser scan there. And on this bottom left, you see where all of that information is fed, was fed into a computer system, and it sort of made a mesh that was an exact replica of that bust. So they did many of the, of the artifacts this way, and as they did, they were able to study them, and they were able then to, to get all of these various um, measurements that were, were from George Washington, because as a, as a master sculptor, Houdon would have, would have measured every part of his body. So when they had all of that information, the other thing that was necessary for them to figure out is, is uh, the one thing that every school child knows about George Washington, and, and that is that he had dentures. He did indeed have dentures, and these are actually the dentures that George Washington actually um, had in his mouth at some point in his life. I like to point out when I do school visits, this, the one on the, the top left, as you see that, that spring there is really a heinous looking thing there. 
So every time now when I look at the dollar bill and I see that picture of George Washington, I envision a denture very much like this one in his mouth and I have a lot of sympathy for him. Uh, at the time, he would have struggled to keep that in his mouth and he would have uh, been really sort of embarrassed about the way that it made his mouth look. But these dentures actually play a very important role in this process. What they were able to do with this is determine, because of that denture, determine the shape of his jaw. And every step along the way, they then put that, that information to see if it fit perfectly within that bust, because this was the gold standard. If it didn't fit there, then it wasn't right. So as the project moved along, the science end of it came to a close, and they ended up with these three incredible computer files of George Washington as he would have looked at 19, at 45, and 57. Now you can see that, that there is actually quite a lot of difference in these, in these images if you look closely. At, at 19 years of age, he would have had a much longer face than he did later in life. As he lost teeth, as, his, uh, when he, as he did throughout his life, his face would have appeared shorter and shorter. So this information really was an important part. When the computer files were finished, it went to a foam head and then to a wax, uh, and then to a, a, a clay head. But once again, it took the skill of a master sculptor, and this is Stuart Williamson. It took Stuart to then take that information and those uh, clay heads and really craft into those heads and those faces an expression and a moment in time, the wrinkles, the concern that you see on his face, it took a master sculptor once again to accomplish. From there, as you see on the left, those clay heads were then turned into wax heads. Then when the wax heads were finished, these eyeballs were placed in, in those heads. Because if you think about it, if, if their eyeballs were wax, they would never look real but they put these in, in beautiful acrylic eyeballs and there's no doubt that George Washington's eye, eye color were, was blue-gray. Many people of his day wrote about the color of his eyes, so there's no doubt about that. So as the project sort of moved along, it went to really to the pure art end of things. I really had a very fortunate experience when I was doing the, the work for this book because I had the, the incredible opportunity to go to Mount Vernon when they were doing the yearly maintenance of these three figures. Um, and these, uh, on the left is Diana Cordray, who's the Mount Vernon Education Center manager. And in the middle is Sue Day, who is an incredible artist, as you will see. And on the right is Stephen Horak, a, a magnificent uh, wig master. And so while I was there, I was able to really see these uh, figures as they are, were maintained and see what they looked like and what they felt like. And then I was, course, of course, able to ask all of the questions that I needed to ask and, and to, to um, you know, ask all the things that I'd asked when I was a little girl. You know, how, how, how long did it take you? And what's it made out of? And why and why and why? And then what happened? So um, this is really, uh, was a really a wonderful opportunity for me to see these, these figures as they were being um, worked on and see them up close and see how they really went about creating them. Sue Day is, is not only, art, only the artist that uh, you will see in a moment, but she's also um, the one who put the hairline into each of the three uh, figures of George Washington. You can see that here in this, in this slide, she is putting uh, one human hair at a time directly into the wax. And in this way, it looks like the hair is actually growing out of his head. It's really critical to get the hairline right on these figures. And she's constantly checking against uh, these, all of these images of George Washington because if the hairline was not correct, then none of it look, would look right. So she, uh, one by one, she used this, this uh, tool to put in that hairline and she did so for, for each of these figures. Uh, it's, it's painstaking work. Also, it's, it's, there's no doubt what color George Washington's hair was. 
The reason there's no doubt is that there are, are many locks of his hair that still exist today, and I actually got to see some of it. It's a kind of a chestnut color. It's not really red. It's not really brown. It's somewhere in the middle. And so she is uh, using hair that was uh, purchased from a hair merchant in London in exactly the color that they needed it to be. This is an image of Stephen Horak as he is uh, uh, getting ready to put one of his, his custom wigs back on one of the George's uh, heads. And as you can see on the left side, um, this, this wig is one that, that goes on General Washington's head. Um, he takes one human hair at a time and makes a custom uh, netting and, and makes those wigs, those custom wigs that fit exactly on those three figures. And uh, Stephen is also the one who, who um, does George Washington's hair. So as the progress of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of these three heads continues, I wanted to show you this image, which is young George Washington at the age of 19, as he would have looked uh, when he was a surveyor in the, in the wilderness of Virginia. His eyeballs are in, his hairline is in, that incredible wig is on the back of his head, and he has one base coat of paint on his face. And then Sue, De Sue Day creates magic. And she takes that, that very uh, pale face and she creates uh, George Washington. I write in the book uh, and I try in, in, in my books and when I speak to school uh, children all over, I really try to bring all of this to life for them by saying every time I see this figure, I, I know that it, that it doesn't feel like stubble when you touch his face, but it looks so real, that five o'clock shadow, that it looks like you would feel it. Here is one of my favorite images of young George Washington an up close and personal look at this incredible figure. And when I look at this, I, I remind people that each eyebrow was inserted one human hair at a time, each eyelash one human hair at a time. And so I think the, the incredible skill of Sue Day is really clear here as she makes these, these incredible pieces uh, look like they could talk. So, George Washington also needed a body, and the, re and the way that the uh, experts created what is, is an accurate representation of the way his body looks is because they studied the textiles that he wore. There are many pieces of clothing that still exist that George Washington wore during his lifetime. The, the uniform on the left is at the Smithsonian Museum of, Nat of American History. The, the things on the right are actually in the collection at Mount Vernon. So a textile expert looked and investigated all of his pieces of clothing and measured each, pe each piece exactly, and were not on, they were not only able to understand the size of George Washington, but also how he fit in those clothes. So they understood very well what his body would have been shaped like. Linda Baumgarten is the textile expert at Colonial Williamsburg, and I interviewed uh, her, Linda for the book, and she gave me the, the real thrill of going into the vault at Colonial Williamsburg to see authentic 18th century clothing uh, in, in, the, in their incredible collection. She was able to really answer a lot of questions for me. I was able to ask her, uh, uh, you know, what part of George Washington's uh, life and the way he moved were, um, you know, had to do with the kind of clothes he wore and the way it made him stand and the way it made him move. And all of those things were really very important to me. I like to say that George Washington came to life for me at Mount Vernon, but the 18th century came to life for me at Colonial Williamsburg. Here are the finished um, figures as you would see them at Mount Vernon today. This shows young George as a surveyor, 19 years old, and each piece of his clothing was made by hand using 18th century methods, and they're ab absolutely stunning. This is what General George Washington would have looked like 
at about the time he was at, at Valley Forge. And this is what President George Washington would have looked like on the day of his first inauguration. But as I said, to know George Washington is really for me when I went to Mount Vernon. Um, Mount Vernon is owned and operated by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. And the first time I went there, I wanted to sit on, on the back porch, the piazza, and watch the sun come up. And I did that. I got up at 4.30 one morning, in the, and it was dark, and I made my way there, and I sat down at the, on that far right side and watched the sun come up over the Potomac River. And for a, a biographer like, like myself, there has to be a moment when I really connect with my subject. And for me, that, that moment was, was right here. I saw this incredible sunrise come over the Potomac River, and I realized how many times must George Washington have seen this very sight. And for me, it was a moment that he became real. In my research, he really became more and more real the more I, I, I researched his life. Here is a close-up of young George, and in each of these periods of time that I talk about in the book, I really like to, um, to sort of sum up what George Washington was like. At this point in his, in his life, uh, in, in these, these years when he's an, a man, he ended up to be about 6'2", a ruddy complexion with chestnut colored hair. He was athletic and strong and he had long arms and long legs. He was a survivor of the wilderness. He loved the horse races, fox hunting, cards, billiards. He was fashionable and he was very interested in clothing. He was one of the best dancers in Virginia and he was very ambitious. I really, um, when I, again, when I talk to school kids, when I do school visits, I like to explain George Washington in this way. George Washington was such a man that the men admired his athletic ability and the ladies wanted to dance with him at the ball. <laughs> and I firmly believe that when he came into the room, every head turned. He was also, by the time he was 22 years old, he was actually already famous, not only in Virginia, but in England and in um, France. He wasn't famous necessarily for something great because of what he was sort of involved with actually began the French and Indian War. So he was actually well known long before he became the father of our country. Um, I really um, had an, a very interesting way to connect with George Washington when I found out that George, the letters that George wrote to his wife Martha, only two of them exist. And I was fascinated because those two letters are from 1775, right when George Washington is taking command of the Continental Army. And I love this letter, which I found a way to put into the book, where he is telling her from Philadelphia, and he says, you know, I, that he's going to have to take command of the Continental Army. And he's basically saying, now, now Martha, I've got to go. You know I've got to do this. And then he says at the, at the end, I shall feel no pain from the toil or the danger of the campaign. My unhappiness will flow from the uneasiness I know you will feel at being left alone. But I had a wonderful experience also at Mount Vernon that I just, uh, I was not able to fit this letter, the second letter from George to Martha in the book. And so I told myself that any time I spoke about this book, I would tell this story. <laughs> so here it is. This was actually written just a few days after that first le letter, and he was still in Philadelphia getting ready to go to Cambridge. And he s writes Martha and he says, they're waiting on me to leave, and I'm going now to, t to the camp at Boston. But he tells her in the bottom, I retain an unalterable affection for you, which neither time nor distance can change. So for me, this was really an important part of understanding George Washington, because sometimes I think um, he and Martha's relationship is sort of 
um, made into something it's not. And I think in these letters, I see George Washington, who had a deep love for his wife. By the time Washington is at Valley Forge, um, he is in a period of time during the war that's difficult. He is um, being discussed in Congress as, you know, kind of in whispers that maybe we need to get rid of him. He's really not doing so hot in this war. And so he, when he leads his men to winter quarters at Valley Forge, George Washington has a lot on his mind. You can see that Stuart's incredible um, um, mastery of sculpture here. You can see Sue Day's incredible talent in painting the space. And you can see the worry and the stress in his eyes because he knows that he is going into winter quarters, that the British are occupying Philadelphia, their capital, and they're only 16 miles away. And his men, a lot of them don't have any shoes on their feet. And as they walk through the snow, they leave bloody footprints. And they don't have enough clothes to keep them warm when it's their turn to be on guard and some in Congress want to replace him. So he has a lot, a lot on his mind here. But I tried in this book to really show George Washington through the eyes of his contemporaries. And in this place, I think, is a beautiful statement about George Washington. This was written by a, a Frenchman who was an aide to von Steuben who came to Valley Forge to help Washington. And this is what he said about George Washington the first time he saw him. I could, not help keep, I could not keep my eyes from that imposing countenance, grave yet, yet not severe, affable without familiarity. Its predominant expression was calm dignity through which you could tr trace the strong feelings of the patriot and discern the father as well as the commander of his soldiers. So I think that's just a beautiful uh, way to look at George Washington through the eyes of someone who saw him at Valley Forge. After the war was finally won, and it took eight long years, which Washington spent the entire time with his troops without going home for winter quarters, he was actually given the, the, the incredible honor of being the first person to sign the U.S. Constitution. Now you'll notice uh, it was not signed until five years after the war was over. It was a very difficult and unsettling time and they had to really go through a lot to get this constitution which, which put into place the, not only the Congress but the presidency and vice presidency. And Washington was given the honor of being the first to sign. As the first presidential election came up, George Washington was, was voted unanimously to be the first president of the United States. And in reality, probably there was no other choice but George Washington. I write in the book, and when I, when I speak, I like to set the scene. I like to, for readers uh, to feel that moment, see that moment, hear that moment. And I think um, this is one of those times in the book that I really, I really built a scene around, all accurate, of course, through primary source documents. And this, at this moment, when, when George Washington is going to become the first president of the United States, a crowd is gathered in the intersection of Wall and Broad Street. Both still exist today. And if you had been there that day, you could have looked to the left to see Trinity Church, which you can still do today. And the building that the inauguration was held in was called Federal Hall. It's not the same Fed Hall that you see today, but it, the one there has, has replaced it. But as, as the crowd is waiting for George Washington on that day, he comes, he is driven up in a white coach with six white horses, and he's let out onto the cobblestones of that intersection there and the crowd is silent when he gets out. And they remove their hats, and he removes his. And he bows to one side and to the other till he makes his way. 
And then in front of the entire crowd, he takes the oath of office on the balcony of Federal Hall, and the crowd just weeps. So many different people were there, including some foreign dignitaries. And I, one of those was a representative of France, and this is how he described George Washington on that day. He has the soul, look, and figure of a hero united in him. Born to command, he never seems embarrassed with the homage rendered him, and he has the advantage of mingling great dignity with great simplicity of manner. So I really love to see George Washington through the eyes of somebody who was there on that day. As I, I close my comments today, I, I do love this image uh, that is actually the opposite of the image that's on the book cover. It's of the three Georges lined up together, and I think they're just absolutely stunning. I do like, would like to mention that the, the Mount Vernon project to make these three figures was made possible by a grant from the uh, Donald W. Reynolds Foundation. And it has been an honor for me to have the chance to, to take part in making the story come to life for a new generation of Americans. And it's been uh, a, just a real treat for me uh, because Mount Vernon has opened their arms and has been gracious and let me do all the research that I needed. And it's just been a, a really a personal um, thrill for me. So. Um, as we conclude this, I we, I'd love to take some questions if you have any. Yes. And also, if you would come to the microphone in the center, please, so we can hear if anybody would like to ask a question. Hi, Carla. Hi. Um, have you considered writing about any other presidents in this manner? investigating them and humanizing them for children? And if so, do you have any particular presidents um, in mind that interest you most? I never have really thought of doing it because this, this project was so unique that I'm not sure it will ever be done in this way again. And I, you know, I, I'm always looking for ideas and new, new book ideas but I don't have any real plans for that because this is so unusual. And, and the reason that it works with Washington is that he was, of course, during before the days of photography. So the presidents that were alive after photography was around, the, getting a true sense of what they look like is not the same. You know, so, but um, I'd love to dig into a new president any day. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello, my name is Patrick. Um, how do you go about picking your subject matter when you're selecting the books to write about? It's really, they each come in a different way, really, for me. I think um, the first one, the head bones connected to the neck bone, is because I was a radiologic technologist, and that was the world that I knew. And then the Marie Curie book, something out of nothing came out of that book. And then the next one, I was interested in the Holocaust, and so I wrote about, I found the story of Varian Fry, who was an American Holocaust rescuer. And then after that came George Washington, and then after that is Tech Titans about the modern tech guys. So they, they all sort of find me, in a way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you started uh, your presentation with some myths that you found out weren't true. What did you find out that was particularly interesting uh, in your research that you didn't believe before that is true? I think there's so many things, really. Uh, what, part of what fascinated me in this project was the detail that the experts went, the links they went to. Uh, one of the things um, is that when George Washington was 19, he went with his brother to uh, the Caribbean because his brother had tuberculosis. And so he caught uh, smallpox while he was there. So for the rest of his life, George Washington had smallpox scars on his face. And if you look carefully in, in, at the 
at the uh, portraits of George Washington, if you see his left side, you will see a smallpox pox scar right there. And the two older figures of George Washington have that, have that pock mark. And, um, and it's interesting now to me, now that I know that, and I look at portraits of Washington and see that all of these artists, it's always there. And so um, it must have been very obvious. You know? So I think that's one little tiny detail. But, but as far as what he did, I had no idea that of his involvement in the French and Indian War. I had no idea that when he was a very young man, he had a, a lot of responsibility, and he did a lot of, of trips for for the government, you know, for the for Virginia, and uh, was in the Virginia militia, and uh, so there was just many many things about him that I didn't know, and uh, I think Washington for me is one of the people that I've researched that the more you know about Washington, the better he gets. Sometimes it's the opposite when you research someone's life. So uh, he's one of the really extraordinary men, and I really believed myself that had he not been who he was, we would not be what we are as a country today. If, if, if you had a chance and all three of those figures were alive, uh, and you said that uh, each of those, or are, are Washington's life had become personal to you, which one of those three would you want to go hug? <laughs> Young George. <laughs> and I, I think I'm, I'm really partial to Young George Washington because I knew n absolutely nothing about him at, in that p part of his life. And the idea that he was really such a rugged man and, and just... It, it just altered my way of thinking about George Washington. Um, you know, I can't, I sometimes think, you know, about that country song, A Country Boy Can Survive. <laughs> That's how I feel about him. I, he could have survived in the wilderness forever, and, and it was extraordinary. So, young George really is my favorite. <laughs> Thank you. Yes? Carla, would you talk uh, a little bit about the other research you've done on your other books? Because your research has been extraordinary, and the, you didn't get to do this by having your name drawn out of a hat. Uh, you were chosen to do this because uh, of your research, but you've done just an enormous amount on your other books. Could you talk about that a minute? Yes, thank you. I do a lot of research. I feel very much when, when you write for the kinds of books that I write, they have to be accurate. And I don't believe that you can just throw that together. And, and so for every book I've written, I really have done the work in a way that I, that I can be proud of having done it. And the, the book that was before this one, I'm especially proud of, which was about Varian Fry an American Holocaust rescuer who is, whose story is very little known. And the fact that he volunteered to go to Marseille, France and rescue more than 2,000 people, I think is a story that, that is amazing. And, and I'm sad that very few people know it. So to do, to do all of that research uh, and for the Varian Fry book, I went to Columbia University where his papers are housed and went through hundreds and hundreds of letters to him and from him. And, but it was in those letters, and it's true for every person that I've ever studied, it's through those letters that you get to know these people. The same is true for Marie Curie. After a while, you, you, you start recognizing the way they talk and the way they related and the, the way they would phrase things uh, in Washington the same way. After a while, they're so familiar that they almost become like a friend because you, you know that, that every, the way they put their thoughts together, um, and, and for the Varian Fry book, it was in those, those letters that I found out the color of the trolley, you know, the, the smell of, of, of what he could see and smell and the fear that he saw in the faces of those refugees. You know, it was through his words that really made him come to life for me. 
So I think it's that very personal uh, research into their own words uh, that really makes the difference. And that's what I try to bring. I try to bring that to life so that, again, my readers can, can feel it and hear it, smell it and see it. You know, I think that is what a good book should do. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, much as George Washington is portrayed as the father of our country on the dollar bill, Martha Washington is this grandmotherly figure. What did you learn about her uh, that interested you and you thought, think we should know about? Um, I had to cut Martha out of the book <laughs> in so many places. Uh, and so it's like, uh, you know, I guess in great films, you know, they say, well, that was on the cutting room floor. <laughs> There's a lot of Martha in the cutting room floor up here. And, and I really, uh, I, I wanted her in the book much more than she's in the book, but as an author, you have, to, you, have to, you have to stay with what the book is about. And I did put her in as much as I could. Um, but like I said, I, my concession prize is that I tell that letter story when I'm out. But um, I think what I learned about Martha is that um, another myth, in a way, is is people kind of think, ah, oh, he married her for her money, and you know, and and sort of make it different from what I believe it was. Uh, I believe that George was lucky to have Martha, and Martha was lucky to have George. I think they they he was well known already, and he was um, a good catch. She was a very wealthy widow, and. All of, the, all of the bachelors knew all about her, and she was a good catch. But I think as, as time went on, they truly, truly loved each other, and uh, I think that she is what kept him grounded in a lot of ways. And she went to winter quarters whenever he called. When he wrote to her, it's time to come, she came. And she would stay until it was time to leave. And in that day, in case people don't know, in that day they would go in the winter and have into winter quarters and they didn't fight battles a lot in the winter. So she would come and the soldiers loved her and, and at their, in absolutely everything, people sang her praises. I mean, she was just what she looks like on, in, those, in those portraits. And I think for George Washington, um, he had, this is, this is Carla's opinion, he had a mother who was difficult and I think he had a, a, he'd fallen in love with a woman that was not a good idea since she was already married when he was, when he was a very young man. And so I think he had a lot of, um, a lot of things that, that Martha was just like a solace for him. I think I think she was exactly what George Washington needed. Anything else? You kind of captured my attention with those teeth and that big spring. Back, it brought me back to the braces days, and I thought, oh God, that was even worse. <laughs> so, could you tell us? I I can't picture dentists at this era. So, who made these false teeth, and what were they made out of, and all that? Did you learn all that? Yeah, absolutely. It's really, and I do go into that in the book because it's a fascinating part to it. Um, the the ones that I saw that I showed today, um, the the ones from Mount Vernon that have the the metal on them. The the upper teeth are cow and horse teeth. The bottom were human teeth, but probably not George's. Uh, they um, the others were carved out of hippopotamus ivory with human teeth uh, in some of those. Uh, it was common in the 18th century for poor people to sell their teeth. And there were dentists who made false teeth. And, and they, they, Washington had several pairs of dentures throughout his lifetime. And he was probably buried with one set. And so those three that I showed are not the only dentures he ever had. But they're the three that there's no question about. But there, there was a, quite a bit of dentistry going on, far more than I ever would have dreamed in, before doing this book. And, but those teeth and that fact that he lost teeth made, was a huge part of, of recreating these figures 
because that really told them about the shape of his face and the shape of his jaw, which made a huge, huge difference. So um, it's his, his teeth, it's a sort of a, to me, it's sort of a sad thing. Of course, he's probably not the only one in his day that didn't have a lot of teeth. But um, to be in the public eye as he was and to have dentures like that, it was, it was a struggle. He had a lot of pain with his teeth. Uh, and it was difficult. So, well, thank you very much for coming to see uh, this presentation tonight, and it's been an honor and privilege. Thank you. Thank you.